He was not a Russian, but a German. His native Prussia threw him out. France did the same, so he spent most of his life in England. He never lived in Russia, but his thinking lives there yet. His name was Karl Marx. His vision was narrow and fanatic, and in several ways simply unrealistic. But it was intense. In 1848, Marx and a fellow Prussian named Engels wrote a small book which was to have a large effect on world history. Its opening words were perhaps more prophetic than even its authors knew. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. Just what is communism, as conceived by its founders and as it has turned out in practice? I suppose you could say that it is basically a materialistic religion. Its gods are matter, economics, and a strange deterministic concept of history. Its prophets are Karl Marx, whom you've already met, and Vladimir Lenin, who took up where Marx left off and put Marx's theories into action. The objective of communism at the outset was to establish itself as the only form of society on Earth. Today, its objective is still exactly that. But communism has had its troubles along with its triumphs in the last half century that it's been at work in the world. The purpose of this film is to present a basic orientation as to the origins, the objectives, the strengths and the weaknesses of the system we know as communism. So let's begin where it began. Russia. Like America, a wide country, rich in natural beauty. It has inspired some of the world's greatest musicians, writers. But for its people outside the ruling class, Russia in the early 1900s offered more of hardship than of beauty. Tsar Nicholas was in the final years of his reign. He didn't know it at the time, but he was the last of the Tsars of Russia. His fatal mistake he ignored the growing unrest of a hard-pressed people at a time when it could no longer be ignored. The Tsar's authority crumbled. It appeared that a genuinely democratic reform might be established. This the communists did not want. Lenin, who had not been in Russia when the revolution began, came back and got to work. Under the direction of Lenin and others, the Bolsheviks took over the popular revolution. They were much in the minority, but they were organized and they had no reservations. It was brother against brother. The disciplined, trained, professional revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, won, as Lenin had determined they would. chance for a new democracy to come out of the revolution was over. The red flag was raised in victory. With the turrets and spires of Moscow as a setting for its headquarters, international communism had made its beginning. Marx, then, was the man of basic doctrine, and Lenin was the man of action. Together, these two provided the blueprint for the communist plan for world domination. It's important to understand at least the five basic points of the doctrine they worked out. First thing to realize is that the true Marxist has to put all his eggs in one basket. Because point number one in the doctrine of Marx is economics 
is the only factor which determines the course of history. That's a pretty narrow basket to put all your eggs in. To accept this view is to assert that a leader like Moses and the ideals he codified have had no effect in the development of society as we know it. And again, a purely economic view of history cannot account for the obvious fact that another leader, Jesus, through some 20 centuries, has been a major influence in the lives of men. Nevertheless, there is no place in the Marxian view of history for them. Also ignored are scientific advances as such. This formula of Einstein's, for example, had little to do with economics. But on it is based the whole technology of the atomic age. Clearly, scientific advance can't be simply ignored as a historical influence. It appears that Marx has badly oversimplified things here. Yet to a Marxist, this very simplicity has great appeal. Point two is another example. The trouble here is that Marx should have added one key word, partly. True enough, there's been plenty of social conflict throughout man's history, and our century has been no exception. But there has also been cooperation. Clearly, the forces that hold society together must be greater than those that would pull it apart, or society couldn't exist. Marx developed his theories during the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. The workers, as a class, were just coming into being and were often exploited. Marx believed the worker class would inevitably grow larger and be still more exploited until in a final violent explosion, the workers would dig the grave of capitalism. He overlooked the possibility that workers would form unions and gain a full partnership in the capitalist system instead of overthrowing it. So Marx's second point suffers from oversimplification too. Now how about the third basic concept of communism? That government is a tool used by one class to oppress another. Even in Marx's time, by the late 19th century, universal manhood suffrage was the rule among the democratic nations which meant that those wishing government positions had to gain them from the voters. And an awful lot of the voters were now working people. From that time to now, for a government to ignore the working man, much less try to oppress him, would be plain political suicide. Ironically, a prime example today of government by executive committee of a ruling minority is found in the communist nations. No democratic form of government could afford to function that way. It would be voted out before it knew what was happening. So point number three has turned out to be true in the communist countries. Now the fourth point, that only through violence can basic social change be brought about. Here, too, history has brought contradictions. For example, in the early days of America, political power was almost entirely in the hands of landed gentlemen from the South and New England. Since then, America's political power has been so thoroughly and widely spread among all social groups that it can only be called a historic change of major importance. And yet no violent revolution was necessary to achieve this. So point number four hasn't worked out too well historically either. If I seem to be punching holes in all of Mr. Marx's basic assumptions, I can't take the credit for it. The course of human events has beaten me to it. But there is one more point in our list of five basic tenets of communism 
And this one is not so shaky as the other four. It comes not from Marx, but from Lenin. Communism's success depends upon professional revolutionaries. Lenin was more practical, less of a visionary than Marx. He knew that the mass of people would not choose for themselves the harsh revolutionary path. A professional elite would have to do it for them. Lenin, the activist, agreed with Marx, the determinist, that communism was destined to rule the world. But his vision of how this would come about required a professional minority to direct the common herd. Earlier, we saw Lenin masterminding just such a dedicated minority in the takeover of the Russian Revolution. He and his successors went on from there. Let's look at how they did. Led by Lenin, the Bolsheviks built their power. Lenin was a pro. And a young man named Stalin was learning a lot from him. Then in 1924, time caught up with Lenin. The leadership of the communist movement was up for grabs. When the smoke cleared, Stalin and his group were in. One of his key men was a burly professional named Khrushchev. The nearly 30 years of what we now call the Stalin era had begun. One prime Stalin objective, industrialize Russia. As years passed, much was achieved toward this goal, but at a harsh price to the people of Russia. In addition to years of imposed hardship and sacrifice, Reliable estimates put the slave labor totals at 15 to 20 million people. Lenin had given farmers some freedom to gain their support. Now in control, Stalin reversed this. The farms were collectivized. Objections were eliminated by eliminating those who objected. They too numbered in the millions. Stalin had to have industrialization to realize another goal, the build-up of a large modern fighting force as soon as possible. He bought time by agreeing to a non-aggression pact with a deadly enemy, Nazi Germany. When the cynical pact with the Nazi regime was broken, it surely came as no great surprise to Stalin. Communist leaders gained experience, and the Russian people gained additional hardship. Stalin's long-range plans were actually helped by the war. The USSR came out of it with a stronger military establishment than ever. And in the political and economic vacuum which followed World War II, communism took over Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania. For communism, a considerable advance in power. For its people, post-war austerity on top of what had already been a strikingly low standard of living. In the United States, Lenin's doctrine of the working professional was at work. The actual number of hardcore card-carrying members was not very large, even by the 1940s. But they worked hard, and they still work hard, to bring about the day when communism would govern the United States. They perfected the now familiar technique of using front organizations, groups not admittedly communist, to support whatever the party line might be at any given time. The names change with time. The objectives do not. Those objectives have found little acceptance, however, among the workers of America. The fact was they already had the freedom and the power to take care of their interests through collective bargaining. They had already won the highest living standards in the world.
Meanwhile, the USSR was not to remain the only great political power in the communist world. By 1949, bitter civil war in China was coming to an end with the Chinese communists in control. Mao Zedong established a Soviet-type government with himself as its head. Within a year, Mao journeyed to join hands with the USSR. More than 500 million people were thus added to the communists' camp, and all was happiness and smiles at the time. China and the Soviet Union signed a 30-year pact of friendship and mutual aid. With their combined manpower pool of nearly a billion people, they looked forward to great things. In South Korea, communism sought to invade and conquer. But the free world stood firm and the aggression was not allowed to succeed. There were troubles with the satellites, too. Tito of communist Yugoslavia broke with Moscow, defying Soviet power. He declared that Yugoslavia would no longer be dictated to by Moscow. And he made it stick. Then in June of 1953, with food scarcer than during the war, East German workers started a strike and marched toward government headquarters. The strike spread across East Germany. The people took over radio stations, demanded the release of political prisoners, freedom of press, free elections, and an end to Soviet domination. Thousands of Russian tanks moved in. Several hundred East Germans were killed and some 50,000 jailed before it was over. And in the fall of 1956, when a Hungarian student protest rally was fired on by political police, a bloody rebellion got underway. Workers went on general strike. Regular Hungarian police and army men joined the freedom fighters. And incredibly, they won. Symbols of communist domination were burned. Hungary was free. For five days, political power was in the hands of popular organizations. Dozens of democratic newspapers hit the streets. Cardinal Minzenti, with other political prisoners, was freed. Then on November 3rd, nearly 200,000 Russian troops and some 5,000 tanks moved in. A week later, the Hungarian uprising was over. During those years, there were major changes in the Soviet Union itself. By the early 1950s, Joseph Stalin was in his 70s. In 1953, after nearly three decades of one-man rule, Stalin was dead. And once again, the political push and pull for power was on. Malenkov became premier, and no dramatic change was immediately apparent but a shrewd jockeying for position was going on in the years that immediately followed. From his position in the party secretariat, Nikita Khrushchev was busy building himself up for the premiership. With Bulganin, who would hold the office briefly before him, Khrushchev was seen all over the world. A roving ambassador for communism. By 1958, the working and planning and power building had paid off. Nikita Khrushchev held the two key posts of first secretary to the party and premier. He had established himself as the master of the Cold War technique the architect of the peaceful coexistence line. He attended a major meeting of the United Nations and made it clear that he believed the communist world could bury the West without resort to large-scale warfare. Peaceful coexistence. 
it was Khrushchev's turn, his invention. And to the extent that it served communist aims, he meant it. But in 1962, peaceful coexistence was interrupted when reconnaissance photos uncovered Russian-supplied nuclear missiles in Cuba. Faced with a showdown, Khrushchev had the missiles removed. But had they reached readiness before we discovered them, the nuclear threat in our hemisphere would have been very real indeed. Apparently, peaceful coexistence was a highly elastic term. In communist China, Khrushchev's policies received more and more criticism. Chinese audiences applauded violent attacks on him as a betrayer of the true Marxist revolutionary teachings. Mao Zedong's plans for a great leap forward in China had failed disastrously. The small measure of industrialization he had achieved could not begin to meet the needs. And trying to do the job by hand through sheer force of numbers, continued to drain the strength of a tired and poverty-riven populace. Mao provided an outlet for the frustrations of his people in demonstrations and bitter attacks on Western imperialism, and more and more on the Soviet Union as a turncoat, betrayer of the revolutionary spirit, and even lackey of the West. The militarism of the dragon intensified and the hate campaign grew more violent in its terms. Top priority was given to developing in China a nuclear bomb of its own. China now billed herself, not Russia, as the true friend of the have-nots. The guide of the newly emerging nations in Africa, Asia, South America. The Soviets were now referred to as another white imperialistic nation, out to defraud and mislead China's non-Caucasian brothers around the world. Between the dragon and the bear, the rift was there. And it was not just an argument between two parties over doctrine. It is a power struggle between two nations and nationalism is a major factor. The border between the Soviet Union and China is 4,000 miles of dispute. This line shows the extent of territory which China claims to have been seized from her by various conquests of the Russian czars. China historically looks on this land as hers. It is one of the largest areas ever claimed to have been taken from a single nation by another. And to make the problem sharper, with less than half the area of Russia, China has three times the population. So the rift between the bear and the dragon widens. But their argument is not whether to bury the free world, but how to bury it, and who will be in charge after the funeral. Vietnam provides a good example of the how as far as China is concerned. By direct violent action, as in this so-called People's War of Liberation. It is part of a plan for gaining control of the industrially undeveloped areas of Asia, Africa, South America, and so encircling the industrial areas of the free world. This plan, too, has run into a good many more difficulties than Asian communist planners had hoped. In the meanwhile, poverty, grinding and unrelieved, has continued as the lot of China's mainland millions. And in the USSR, the scramble of power politics went on. Khrushchev had built his position carefully, and on the surface, all appeared to be going well. But he faced some serious problems. The continued failure of collective farming, the widening breach in communist unity, a scarcity of consumer goods. Behind the smiles 
there was trouble. Then in 1964, the new premier, Alexei Kosygin, was a recognized expert on industrial problems. Khrushchev's other job as first secretary was taken over by Leonid I. Brezhnev. Here was a new generation since Brezhnev had played no role in the revolution. The faces change, but the challenges remain. The military challenge, the economic, the educational and scientific. So let's take a look at just how communism is functioning in the world after half a century. Take a straight look at what it has achieved and what it has not. First, militarily. Here there is considerable and respectable strength. Weapons are modern and firepower great, ranging from the full range of conventional weapons to a massive nuclear intercontinental capability. And the forces which man them are disciplined and well-trained. Industrially, much has been done, though at a cost of decades of harsh austerity. Still, there are problems. A Soviet economist facing facts recently put it this way. Among all the developed countries, we have the worst and most backward structure of production. We have as many machine tools as the United States, but only half our tools are working, while the remainder are either not utilized or in the repair shop. Apparently, the unworkability of the centralized production planning set up by Stalin is becoming too clear to ignore, and controls are being loosened a bit to allow factories to be run more along the lines followed in capitalist countries. In the cities of the Soviet Union, there is something of a newer look, as in the Leningrad Metro, a sort of working showpiece of modern metropolitan transport. On the other hand, such mass transport is sorely needed because individual transport is scarcer here than in any industrial nation on Earth. Western Europe has about 90 cars for every 1,000 people. The USSR, three, and most of these are government-owned. Today, a private Soviet citizen can buy a car, like this one. It will cost him cash in advance, six years wages, if he's the average non-farm worker. And even then, there's a waiting list of a year. This kind of demand for consumer products by the average citizen is a major pressure on communist leaders to reevaluate their industrial system. The challenge of education and science is a very real one. In addition to constant political indoctrination, Soviet schools provide training for the skills and talents on which future advances in Soviet science and technology will depend. The facilities in centers of learning are good and getting better. And promising high-performance students from all walks of life find that there is a place for them in the university programs. Also, special talent or no, those whose families are party officials or members can be sure that the doors of higher education will be open to them. The educational emphasis on science and technology has paid off for the Soviets in the field of space exploration. There is no question that Soviet achievements in space have been significant. Yet the communist system has yet to demonstrate the ability to feed its people. American farmers touring even the best of Soviet collectives were amazed to find production so low, even with abundant good land, that the USSR had to import food from the West. So then, how does communism stand in the world of the 1960s? It is still basically the system originally conceived by Marx and Lenin. A purely materialistic view of man and the universe in which economics alone determines man's destiny. Looked at objectively, 
communism has left its major promise unfulfilled. Its basic premise that economics is the key to all of man's hopes and aspirations and drives has not, in over 50 years, produced a prosperous economic structure of its own. Instead, it has evolved into a tyranny which may be worse for its people in subtler, more important ways than that which gave rise to the revolution. Just the same, the deep determination is there to make the system work and to make it the only system on Earth. As we said at the start, it is narrow and fanatic, and in several ways simply unrealistic. But it cannot safely be ignored, because it is a concept which, for half a century, has animated millions of men, and continues to do so.